like many of us here, I am a lot of things. Starting with my names. My first name, Jeanne, is French. My middle name, Adili, is Swahili. My last name, Datirgwa, is Rwandan. Let me tell you how connecting to one of my many countries changed me, changed how I see me, changed how I see us. In 2015, my family and I moved to Berlin, where my husband had started a new assignment. Now, if you know a thing or two about Berlin, is that you get asked a lot where you're from. When we arrived, I was asked a lot where I'm from. Now, the answer to that question is not simple, at least not for me. So the conversation will usually go like this. So where do you come from? I come from Rwanda. Oh, really? And how did you survive the uh, civil war? By the way, it is called the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I've never lived in Rwanda. Oh, really? Where did you live? My family and I lived in Canada. So you are Canadian? Yes. Now, which one do you feel more, Canadian or Rwandan? Both. How come, since you never lived in Rwanda? My story is that of many people. Third culture kids, diaspora, refugees. My story is that of our modern world, with its geographic boundaries that are crossed every day, physically or virtually through social media. You see, growing up, the concept of Rwanda was instilled in me as somewhat universal. Something I had to carry with me at all times. Some type of moral compass. And internal compass. Well, it had to be. You see, we could not go to Rwanda. Now, why could we not go to Rwanda? Well, Berlin had a lot to do with it. Actually, a lot more than you think. You see, in 1899, Rwanda became a German colony. This is after the 1885 Berlin Conference that divided Africa into European colonies. Now, German, followed by Belgian colonial administrators, introduced the Hamitic hypothesis or Hamitic theory. Now, the Hamitic theory is one that claims that some Africans are descendants of Ham from uh, one of the sons of Noah from the Bible. Ham, Hamitic. Now, the Hamitic hypothesis introduced the notion of racial hierarchies, uplifting some and devaluing others. Now, keep in mind that in pre-colonial Rwanda, there were no ethnic groups. Tutsis and Hutus were social classes. Tutsis were cattle owners, and Hutus were farmers. There were no ethnic groups. Now, the notion that Tutsis are a hermetic, foreign, and superior race was drilled in the minds of Rwandans. This guy here in the slide um, is having his nose, the, the size of his nose measured by, by a Belgian colonial administrator. And he's also having the size of his head measured and the color of his eyes is being established based on some eye color chart. And prior to this, he had his uh, height measured. Now, the purpose of this exercise, it's to create a new ethnic group. And once the ethnic group has been determined, again, based on those, uh, some of those criteria that I mentioned, an ID card is generated, similar to the ones here. And as you can see on the ID card, you have the picture, and right af underneath the picture, you have the newly created ethnic group. It is so important that it comes before the name. 
Now, keep in mind that in pre-colonial Rwanda, to this day, Rwandans uh, share one language, one culture, one spirituality. There are no ethnic groups. Now, post-independence Rwanda. The political elite of Rwanda post-independence continued exploiting the hermetic hypothesis to exclude a portion of the population from power. The notion that Tutsis were a foreign and a superior race led to so many divisions in Rwanda and so much cyclical violence. And it is during one of these periods that many Rwandans fled the country and amongst them my mother's family. Now, being Rwanda post-independence uh, continued to be determined by physical traits such as height, complexion, and the size of the nose. <laughs> and it is this division and the fragmentation that was created that led to the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Now, being the product of Western education, my point of departure, both intellectually and to a great extent culturally, is shaped with this implicit notion of moral superiority and good intentionality. I have to tell you, though, that that was challenged with the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. Watching the coverage on evening news in Canada filled me with many emotions. Shame, powerlessness, sadness, guilt, and anger. Because all we could do was watch. Now, it is true that the genocide was committed by the Rwandan government with a massive collaboration from civil society and with support from powerful countries from the civilized world of human rights systems. It is also true that the genocide was stopped by another group of Rwandans, mostly sons and daughters of refugees, the traditional recipients of lessons on human rights. In July 1994, after 100 days of unimaginable pain and suffering, Rwanda changed for good. Rwanda opened up to all of her children. So, 12 years later, I mustered up the courage to go home for charity work. I was excited, but I was also fearful. You see, the country that my mother had depicted to me was different from the country that I discovered watching footages of the genocide. Now, two years prior, um, with a friend, we had created an NGO called Centre César, which worked with widows and orphans of the genocide. So I was going to teach. I was going to help. I had a savior teacher complex, at least I thought at the time. So when I arrived in Rwanda, I had mixed emotions again. Shame, guilt, powerlessness, anger, anger. But very quickly, shame and Fear turned into admiration, humility, and hope. As I listened to stories from many people I came into contact with, I was expecting to see the ugliness of the genocide, and I did as I listened to stories from the widows and stories from all Rwandans I came into contact with, whether young, old, male, female, victim, perpetrator, those born in Rwanda and those born outside of Rwanda, I discovered stories of amazing human strength 
and resilience. So as I learned, as I learned, and as I started to observe that with nowhere else to go, and left to fend for themselves, because international solidarity had vanished on the first day of the genocide, so with nowhere else to go, the people of Rwanda turned inwards and reconnected with their own traditional systems of knowledge. So there I was, going to teach. I was taught a lot more than I thought I was going to teach. I was given a lot more than I thought I was going to give. The more I listened to stories, the more I discovered that, like I said, with nowhere else to go, they turned inwards and reconnected with their own value systems. Some of the traditional Rwandan culture were, some aspects were reinstated, and I'm gonna name you five. And these aspects of Rwandan culture became pillars of new nation building and common identity recreating. This is the Gachacha courts. Gachacha courts are traditional tribunals. Gachacha courts are very ingrained in Rwandan culture because of their restorative justice aspect. Gachacha courts were reintroduced to deal with the aftermath of the genocide. Keep in mind that in Rwanda, victims and perpetrators continued living side by side. So restor restorative justice was needed to be able to, again, to rebuild a common identity. Giringa, this is a 17th uh, century concept to fight poverty. Uh, Giringa was reintroduced. This is one by which a cow is, don is donated to uh, every poor family. Uh, a cow for, as a means to fight malnutrition, but also to generate income for every poor family. Umuganda, Umuganda is uh, literally, it means coming together with a purpose, whether at the community level or at the, uh, the national level. It's also known as uh, community work. Umuganda, it's done to this day. Uh, it's basically neighbors coming together to clean up their neighborhood. Umuganda has turned Rwanda into one of the cleanest country in the world. I challenge you if you don't believe me. Visit Rwanda. <laughs> Who says poor? means dirty. Who does? The wisdom of agachiro. Agachiro means self-worth, dignity, self-reliance. We are custodians of our own destiny. It is up to us to design what is good for us. And the reconnecting philosophy of Ubumunu, human-centeredness, I am because you are. Again, these five and a few more concepts were reinstated and became pillars of new nation building. They're also known as homegrown solution or homegrown initiatives. Going back to Rwanda changed my life. It changed how I see me. It changed how I see us. I never realized the power of having my last name pronounced correctly. He tried. Actually, he succeeded. <laughs> the peace of being invisible. The peace of never have to explaining myself. Rwanda taught me that we can overcome what divides us. Rwanda taught me that what we create together or aspire to create together is more lasting, is more universal. Rwanda taught me the value of traditional systems of knowledge, the ones that have been forgotten, ignored, or simply devalued. 
Most importantly, Rhonda taught me that connecting to one system of knowledge is not a rejection of other systems of knowledge. It is a means to create a various viewpoint. I believe that lessons of human connectivity and human centeredness from Ubumunu, lessons of dignity, self-worth, and self-reliance from Agachiro, I believe that these lessons can help us mitigate some of the crises that we are facing today, such as climate change, the migration crisis, and terrorism, just to name a few. It is time, if we want to create lasting solutions, it is time that we bring the world to the discussion table. It is time that we start tapping into the wisdom of all systems of knowledge. For no single group in the world, no single region of the world has the monopoly on good intentions and problem-solving abilities. It is then, and only then, that we can start talking about our shared humanity. Dankeschön, Berlin. Thank you.